Clovis from Paris. Oops. Uh, he had planned to stay with his sister who was located in Peru, in, uh, pa in Panama, uh, but she turned him out, wanted nothing to do with him. So he and Laval had to work on the uh, Panama Canal. They got extremely sick, finally saved up enough money to go to Martinique. In Martinique, uh, you have to understand that the native population had died uh, what you had were European white people from usually France who had imported black slaves from Africa. But during the time, uh, the two races had blended to every possible color of brown that you can imagine. And uh, the slaves were freed in 1848 of and Gauguin went to live not with the white people but with the dark people because he felt most at home with them and life was cheap. He was living en sauvage, uh, savagely, uh, primitively, and the idea was that you could actually pick the fruits off the trees and you could uh, fish in the sea and you could have a few domestic animals and you didn't really need money that much. Whereas the first picture that we've, I've talked about is in the Impressionist style. The second picture uh, is entirely different. He's trying to change his style. Uh, the blue of the sea is almost completely flat. The red garment in the foreground is completely flat. And uh, he's seeking new ways to go. He returns to France in October uh, 1887, working as a ship, uh, ship hand on uh, the boat that takes him across. Uh, and uh, then he decides that he wants, after he recovers completely from that journey, uh, he decides he wants to go to Pont Avon. But something aside from his style has changed at this point. And in February from Paris, he writes to Meta, since my departure, in order to conserve my moral strength, I have slowly closed off my sensitive heart all is asleep on that side. You must recall that I have two natures, Indian and sensitive. The sensitive side has disappeared, which permits the Indian to march straight ahead firmly. From Brittany, he wrote to Schuffenegger, I love Brittany. I find in it the savage, the primitive, when my wooden shoes resound on this granite soil, I hear the heavy mat and strong sound that I seek in painting. As he developed the lessons he had learned in Martinique in his style, he wrote of this painting that it's completely Japanese by a savage from Peru. So we know what he meant by his Indian nature. Uh, now, in order to understand this development that we're seeing here, you have to know that for a 19th century Frenchman, Indian, Peruvian, Brittany, Savage, etc., wooden shoes, uh, all these things were primitive. Uh, but then so was anything that wasn't high Renaissance or classical Greece and Rome. In fact, uh, Jan van Eyck, for instance, was considered a Flemish primitive. Giotto was a Italian primitive. So uh, everything gets linked together. You could actually, it's okay, being Japanese and savage in Peru works together. He developed the style of this painting in his vision after the sermon where he actually copied uh, a Hokusai print in Jacob and the Angel who are wrestling in the background. And he separates this flat background where he has also uh, done a, a very small cow and women who reach all the way up to the top, breaking the perspective completely uh, in a very flat style, as opposed to the very three-dimensional heads of the peasant girl in the foreground and his own head on the side as the uh, preacher who has um, 
conjured up this vision. He separates the vision from the reality of those who are seeing the vision by the diagonal tree. The same kind of flat background against a very three-dimensional head uh, is seen in his self-portrait Les Miserables that he made for uh, Vincent van Gogh. In the background, we see uh, Emile Bernard, uh, who was a quote unquote, according to Gauguin, a disciple of his. Uh, and he explained his work to uh, Vincent when he sent it to him as the mask of a bandit, badly dressed and strong like Jean Valjean, who has his nobility and inner sweetness. Blood and heat inundates the face and the fiery tones of a forge that envelop the eyes indicate the fiery lava that blazes in our painter's soul. The girlish background with its infantine flowers is there to our test to our artistic virginity. And this Jean Valjean, whom society oppresses and turns into an outlaw with his love, his power, is not only the image, is he not only the image of an impressionist today? And he uh, accentuates again the lit against the shaded side of his face, the shadows under his eyes, and his hooked nose in a mi very much more pronounced fashion than it ever looked in a photograph, but it's his Inca nose, so it is part of this story. After a trip to Arles, which ended in tragedy, uh, he further developed the split in his character seeing himself, first of all, as uh, Christ, uh, a martyred Christ. Uh, and uh, we can, he based it on the head of uh, Christ from Bouvet, uh, which has the same broken lines on the head, uh, the almost closed but not quite closed eyes, uh, the treatment of the hair on the sides, and the beard that's divided in half, as we see here, which Gauguin actually never had a bifurcated beard. On the other hand, uh, in what doesn't really look like a self-portrait, but which he said represents vaguely a head of Gauguin the Savage, uh, we see a distorted face, a distorted face uh, where um, the gesture of the thumb in the mouth, he variously describes as uh, suppressing the cry of an image in hell. Um, and uh, But we can see as an infantile thumb sucking, or we can see as a sexual uh, Freudian idea. Uh, but we should also see as part of a French idiom, San Malta de Pousse, uh, to bite one's thumb, is a French idiom for to regret. He went back to Brittany and he tried his best to incorporate himself into the Breton uh, life. He dressed as a Breton, he had wooden shoes, and he tried to not only paint them going about their various tasks, but get into their religious life. So he took the central part of the Calvary from the very nearby church of Nizon. Uh, you could see here as circles, it's a really big thing. And he took it, brought it down to earth and set a Breton woman in the curve of Christ's body and arm, her own pose identifying with it. She's wearing a hat from Le Poldu, uh, which is the other place that he uh, settled at this time. Um, he's trying to show an identity between the very religious Bretons and their uh, sculpture, their art, which he wants to become part of. On the other hand, the Bretons were not all that into him. Uh, his painting of La Belle Angèle shows Angel Angelique Sartre as a uh, Breton woman from pont a -Bon displaying her cross very clearly, uh, separated by uh, this circle, which is a Japanese device, but now in gold so that it becomes a halo. She separated both from the 
flowers of nature in the background and the burning uh, fervor either of his feelings or of hell. In the center, he puts a very strange, exotic looking sculpture, which has the head of a cat and the body and position that could recall Buddhist sculpture. Uh, he was very lonely there and he was very frustrated there. And he showed that at the end of the year in 1889 in his uh, relief, which he put in the name of the relief and it translates as be in love and you will be happy. He explained it in detail to Theo van Gogh to whom he sent the uh, relief. And he says, above the city of Babylon rotting, a simple woman whom a devon takes by the hand and who defends herself despite the good tempting counsel of the inscription. Now note that the demon is really based on his savage self portrait and that the woman is married. She has a wedding rig and she could represent anybody from his wife Meta who was not giving in to any temptations by him uh, or to other women that he was trying to seduce. Uh, a fox, a symbol among the Indians of perversity, we see it down here. Many figures who express the contrary of the council, you will be happy uh, to indicate that it is a lie. Now, further indication that it is a lie is in the figure above the fox, uh, where which is based on a Peruvian mummy in the Trocadero. The Trocadero was a place that he liked to visit, had a ethnological museum. And the fact that he bases uh, a, figures, a whole set of figures throughout the rest of his life on this Peruvian mummy shows the uh, importance of the Peruvian background. Here she is a symbol both of an Eve who refuses to give in and of, of death. To make it clear at the end of his letter so that we know what the Indian in that fox is supposed to be about, he wrote to Theo, you know that I have a background by birth as an Indian Inca and everything I do expresses it. It is the base of my personality. To decadent civilization, I think to oppose something more natural stemming from savagery. In opposition to all this frustration, he begins to dream of a uh, life in the tropics um, and a woman who would give in to his temptation. He thinks of going back to Martinique, then he thinks of going to Madagascar, and then Tonkin. In the Tonkinese phase, the Tonkin Vietnam, uh, in the Tonkinese phase, he does uh, this. Eve giving into temptation, plucking uh, the fruit, holding another fruit in her hand. Um, and she is uh, the mother of all humans. And her giving into temptation does not lead to death, but leads to fruitfulness as this copulating uh, cock and hen in the background shows where all the eggs and little chickies that come out at the bottom. The background is based on his memories of Martinique. The uh, pose and the trees are based on uh, a photograph of a relief from the temple of Borobudur. This is the Maitre Kanyaka, but it's not relevant because he didn't know who the Maitre Kanyaka was, or even if it was, or even the name of that figure. What's important is that the head is based on Aline. When he thinks of going to the tropics, he thinks of his adored mother, and he even depicts her as a Tonkinese changing her um, features in order to make her look more uh, Indo-Chinese. By uh, the middle of 1890, Bernard has uh, said, let's go to Tahiti instead. And Tahiti becomes the design goal. And it's, it is a dream as well. In autumn 1890, he's feeling isolated. He wrote to Meta, uh, without a mother, without a wife, without children, 
may the day come that I will go bury myself in the woods on the island in Oceania to live there in ecstasy, calm, and art, surrounded by a new family far from this European struggle after money. There in Tahiti, in the silence of the beautiful tropical nights, I could listen to the murmuring music of the movements of my heart in loving harmony with the mysterious beings of my entourage. Finally free, without worrying about money, I could love, sing, and die. And the Tahitian hut that we see at the bottom is what he envisages as a life with the natives uh, that he will live in harmony with nature. However, that was a dream, was not the reality. At the same time that he's writing this letter to Meta saying, I'm leaving you, I'm going to have a new family, a new life, he also gets a a uh, three-year government artistic mission for a series of paintings to fix the character and light of Tahiti and to study the and intimate, ultimately paint the customs and landscape with an official letter of introduction. Uh, he sets off for Tahiti, uh, but before going there, he goes to Copenhagen, sees Meta and the children and promises that they're going to be reunited as soon as he gets back. So there's the dream of living off in the tropics and the, it's okay, Meta, I'm coming home. Don't worry about it. On April 1st, he leaves for Tahiti and in, on June 9th, he arrives at Papeete. Uh, that was a disaster. Papeete at the time was uh, as much a European city as Lima had been. Uh, all the natives had been converted to Christianity by the early 19th century. Uh, Papiete was a uh, European town with a church in the center, uh, houses that he could find in Europe. And uh, this was not what he was looking for, the no primitive huts. Uh, and he got there a couple of days before the last Tahitian king, King Parari, uh, died, but as you can see from the photograph of King Pomare, uh, who was completely Europeanized, that he wouldn't have helped him find the primitive life either. So what he does is he heads out from Papeete along the route around the central mountain until he gets to Matea, where he actually finds the life he's been looking for and builds a house. Uh, or rather uh, rents a house. Uh, but all that's missing now is he needs a model and he needs a woman to take care of him. So he goes off to find the perfect Tahitian, pure blood Tahitian woman, not a mixture with anything European. And he goes much further on all the way to Faoni where he meets uh, Tehamana, a 13 and a half year old girl who is offered to him as a wife by his, by her parents. And she goes very willingly. It's a, it's a good deal to be the wife of a European. Uh, he tried to do portraits. He actually did one of white people in Papeete, but uh, that was a disaster too. And nobody else wanted him. And he anyway wanted to draw and paint the Tahitians. And he was interested, especially in pure blood Tahitians. And even if they're wearing Western clothing, he here gives this man a uh, white flower in his hair. This white flower is the only flower that is native to Tahiti. All the other flowers that uh, one finds there uh, are European imports. He tries to uh, get acquainted with the landscape. Uh, Tahiti is, the whole center of the island is mountains and forests, uh, as you see here in the mountains, and people live along the coast in their native huts, and uh, he is also interested in the kind of trees they had. This is a pandanus tree which grows its roots from its branches, as he tries to depict it here, it has long spiky leaves. And uh, when they fall off, they form patterns on the ground, which he has made very decorative. If we compare him, his, his work on this, with uh, 
that of Jean Lafarge, who was for several months in Tahiti and left five days before Gauguin arrived, you find that there are a couple of traits that are completely different. Uh, they both describe the landscape, they describe the breakers in the background uh, and the, um, the sea. Uh, but whereas Lafarge has a white skin native, Gauguin will never do that. He much prefers the brown skinned natives who remind him of the, his caretakers in Peru. And the color is also different. Um, John Lafarge's colors are the actual colors of Tahiti. You go to Tahiti today, that's the colors you're gonna find, not the colors of Gauguin. Gauguin's colors, the purples, the reds, the greens, or the blues of different types, the aquas, remind one of the Peruvian costumes that we saw, uh, that he saw in Lima. So he actually blends Tahiti with his memories of childhood in Lima and um, uses its colors to make something special of Tahiti, but he also has uh, a message about Tahitians that he wants to get across. He wants to show that they are equal to possibly better than white culture. And so he bases this Tahitian man with an ax on one of Arosa's photographs of the Parthenon. And he stresses the purity of the Tahitians by turning the Madonna and child into Tahitians, giving them the halos. Uh, she's in a pareo, which is the native dress, and so are they. Uh, she uh, may be best based on um, the pose of an Egyptian peasant in a Bonap painting, uh, but whereas he stressed the sexuality, that's not what's here at all. It, it's instead the purity of these people, the kindness of these people. Uh, and he stresses the worshipers along with the uh, angel on the side here and the fata uh, at the bottom with um, Tahitian fruit, uh, mangoes and bananas. Uh, the figures, these two figures are, are based again on Barabador and they don't look sexy at all, which is pretty logical because they're based on monks who are greeting Buddha uh, and therefore are not really women at all. There's only hints of them being women there. And that's, it's not the sensuality at the moment that he's really interested in, in this work. On the other hand, he does find uh, what he was looking for, a, a woman who will love him in Tahiti. And he uh, redoes the Eve in Tahitian form where he's uh, working, first of all, with the native uh, type of flowers. This is a bird of paradise flower, which admittedly was uh, brought from France. Uh, but this, the Tahitian plants, which he stylizes here was not, but he does have one basic problem with the whole thing of even the temptation. There aren't any snakes in Tahiti. So what he does is he uses a lizard, which he originally puts on a leaf, but then decides that that's not very interesting pictorially. So he turns the leaf into these big red flowers. And uh, he doesn't really like the shape of this flower under her hand. So he decides to go for a different kind of bird of paradise, a uh, peacock feather. And that's what he paints in the painting on a long stem so that it looks sort of like sperm. So that there is an element of uh, seduction in here and an element of sexuality in here. Uh, the fact that this has to do with his life is shown by this uh, reenactment of the temptation on the back of the head of Tea Mana, uh, who uh, he depicted you can see the resemblance to his portrait of Tamana. Here she's wearing a missionary costume and holding a Tahitian fan with uh, Gauguin's artwork in the background and on the top um, writing from Easter Island. Uh, here again, kindly note, 
in both the painting and the sculpture that on the one hand, it can be very primitive, uh, crudely cut or flat, as opposed to very delicately three-dimensional and um, this negation of one style, using two styles to convey the two sides of his personality is normative to him. Uh, one thing that's missing is the religion. As I said, they've all been Christian since the beginning of the 19th century. So he tries to do first what he uh, had done with the vision after the sermon using the same diagonal tree. On one side, he shows the uh, Tahitian women dancing, and this is really the poses of one of the Tahitian dancers. On the other, he tries a um, weird, monstrous form with ghostly dancing figures around it. But then he says, no, actually, he knows what kind of uh, idol worship they have. And the fact that it has to be idol worship is clear to him as somebody who's read the Bible where it is idol worship. Uh, so he takes uh, Marquis and Tiki of the kind that he had perhaps seen in the Trocadero Museum, where he did a little basic research on the subject, uh, and uh, puts his memories of it into the um, dance scene that you see here, which is worshiping around the idol. However, there aren't any idols. And although he uh, found a collector of Oceanian art in Papete, he uh, didn't find any actual large statues in Tahiti. So what do you do if you don't have that thing? You make them up as you go along. And what he did here was to take a um, Buddha and turn him into a savage um, god with uh, tattoos on his legs as he had a photograph of a Marquisian with his entire body tattooed. And if you look at his teeth, you'll see that he's become a cannibal. And for the, uh, then he puts a shell behind him as a kind of halo based no doubt on the kind of Marquisian warrior headdress that he may have seen in Papeete in this collection, but not knowing how it was worn he puts it in the back as a halo instead of it being worn on the forehead. Now, he has no idea what he's doing. He's doing a god. He's doing an oriental god. And that'll have to do for the time being. But when he's sick during the winter of 1891-92, he discovers a book that's going to solve his problem. Uh, the book is Morinho's Voyage aux Ile du Grand Océan Voyages, uh, on the to the islands of the great ocean uh, and he copies every single one of those myths into his own notebook on Cien Kult Mahuri uh, in early 1892. And uh, in that book he found the following. Uh, Taohoa, who is the main god of Tahiti, is brightness. He is the seed. He is the base. He is the incorruptible, the strong one who created the universe the great and sacred universe, which is only the shell of Taroa. Therefore, this shell gets meaning and that figure of the Buddha becomes Taroa. On the sides of this figure, he's basing himself on Marquesan art. Uh, this type of decoration of the two figures, one in back of the other, uh, is a typical uh, Marquesan motif on ore handles, on a fan handles on any type of handle that you can look at. And he copied uh, the idea of the two figures, one behind the other, even copying the uh, um, incisions on the top and on the bottom, taking the head on the top and turning it into masks on the bottom, uh, taking uh, stylistic elements such as the treatment of the hands, the bent eye of the figure, which we see here, but instead of it being just two figures, he uses it as a background to the Buddha figure, a Taroa figure, uh, and he divides the two groups, one against the other, so that we see that they're divided actually in half. Now here again, uh, it's 
Borenhout, who gives him some sort of meaning for these figures. And he um, copies the, uh, this side of the statue into his ancien cult Maori under the following uh, story of Hina and Fatu uh, in Tahitian, because he not only copies the French translation, but also the Tahitian original. And you can see that it's this statue because the, uh, not only do we have the hands and the bent eye, but the um, beard here, you see this beard is taken from the wood graining here and the flower, uh, excuse me, the, the masks here are moved over to the front here. Now, Hina is the major goddess of uh, Tahiti, and she's also the moon goddess. Fatu is the earth god. Hina said to Fatu, revive man after his death. Fatu responds, no, I won't revive him. The earth will die. The vegetation will die, as well as the men whom it nourishes. The earth will end and not be reborn. Hina responds, do as you wish. I will revive the moon. And that which Hina possessed continued to be and that which Fato possessed perished, and man must die. Now, uh, he thought that this was a major Tahitian myth, uh, and I mean, it isn't, but that doesn't matter, but that's what he thought, and therefore he then resurrected his statue in March 1892 into the background, copying it. You see even the two sides and the hint of the Buddha on the foreground and this floral decoration uh, here. And he puts it in the background as a major large statue, the, the original statue you can hold in your hand. Uh, but it, it's now a background for a mythological figure of Verumati, the human beauty who had attracted the love of the god Oro. In October 1892, he asks for repatriation. The whole thing has delays, but the funds are finally approved for him to go last class, in other words, at the bottom of the ship in May 1893. In 1893, as he's preparing to go home, he starts thinking about how he's going to present these myths to the public. And instead of using the Marquesan swords, he now uses anger and uh, Hina and Fatu. Fatu is this giant figure in the background, just as Jupiter was. And the beseeching Hina is here, just as Thetis who besought Jupiter. Uh, the figure of Hina is based on another angle. He turns the source around, taking her position, uh, and if you doubt that this is really where he's getting it from, note the three lines of the water that you see here that end up in a pool of circles, which is exactly what happens here. It ends up in the same way. Uh, he leaves uh, Tahiti on June 4th, arrives in Marseille, in Marseille on August 30th with all his works but broke. However, by September, he has inherited money from his uncle and he invites Meta to join him in Paris. She refuses. Uh, so he just goes on and plans his show, begins writing Noah Noah, which is going to be his version of his trip to Tahiti, where he tries to explain to the uh, Paris uh, spectators what all of his pictures are about. He places them within his life. So it's sort of, he's basing himself on his grandmother's perigenations of a pariah where she makes the parts of it up, he makes parts of it up, but this is the story of his, his being in Tahiti. The show opens on November 10th and <clears throat> in the time that he's in France, he uh, portrays Tahitian scenes. This is even his statue of Hina that he moved into a Tahitian scene. Uh, and um, 
that's quite normal. Uh, you go away to a distant land, you take sketches, you make a couple of paintings, you come back and you really start painting. That's what Delacroix did and Godin continues in that romantic tradition. On the other hand, he set up his studio so that it would uh, have very clear Tahitian signs. There's a Pareo in the background here, and he puts his paintings on the wall. And in January 1894, he takes up with uh, a girl who is called Anna La Javanese, even though she is um, from Sri Lanka of Malay and South Indian blood. And um, he poses her as Tamana. He dresses her as Tamana, and here she is in the pose of uh, the picture he had painted of, of Te Amana, Manao to Papau, uh, which is seen in reverse in the mirror uh, as he's doing his self-portrait. Ana La Javanese was a mistake, uh, basically because when he took her and her monkey to Brittany, uh, he had to defend her against people who were mocking her. And in the process, he got into a battle and his leg was broken. It's at this point that he has an outbreak of syphilis and uh, the leg never heals properly and begins to develop sores all, all, all over it. Anna takes off and uh, Gauguin decides in September that it's time to return to Tahiti. He's embittered by the poor reception of works. Uh, he's embittered by the court's failure to punish those who broke his leg and by the loss of his Breton works that he had left at Le Poldu. In February 1895, his auction is a failure, but on July 3rd, he embarks for Tahiti. And Tahiti too, the second trip in Tahiti where he settles now in Punea and builds a house uh, with a studio attached and his own statues around it. Um, it's a repeat of Tahiti won. In fact, he immediately calls for Tehamana to come join him. She comes, takes one look at the sores on his, his legs and leaves. Um, he takes up with Pau Ura, who is a 14 and a half year old uh, native of Punea. So she's a local girl and she's quite happy to go along with him. Uh, he's still copying the Parthenon. He's still copying uh, the Barobador um, relief, you can see here, here, this one has taken the pose from here in the heads from down below, from the turning heads. Here, in the second picture, the uh, duplication of the pose is exact. Um, the only new primitive source that he's brought in is the Bukaki ancestor figure from New Zealand. Uh, he stopped at the Auckland for um, a whole month on his way to Tahiti. He was stuck there uh, and he must have had a photograph of this with him. But when he uses it in the background of his painting of the idol, he uses not the style of the Maori New Zealand artist with his carves, intricate carving, but his own uh, original style from the first Tahiti period, even placing this statue on a base that has the Hina Fatu motive. And in the background, he's put a Last Supper, uh, which we can also see in this painting of the Last Supper, which also has a Hina and Fatu motive on the base of the column. This has to do with his um, work. He's very, very ill at the time. He's really stuck with that leg that is killing him. He's in pain, he's on morphine, but he, while he's lying in bed, he reads a lot on comparative religion and creates a syncretic religion of his own, both in his paintings and in his writings. Uh, now, what's um, interesting here is that he's ill all the time to the point, uh, he's also broke, uh, to the point of attempting suicide at the end of 1897, but he never talks about going back to France. On the contrary, he'd rather work as an office in Tateate. 
He gets involved in colonial politics, taking the side of the Catholics against the Protestants and writing uh, satirical articles in the uh, newspapers in Papeete and even editing his own newspaper. Uh, in April 1899, Paura gives birth to a son whom he calls Emil after his eldest son with Meta, so that it looks like he's starting a new life finally. But in January 1900, uh, he makes a contract with Volard, which is going to make him financially secure. At this point, he decides that he, in March, that he is going to move to the Marquesas, which is a place he's always wanted to go to. It's a repeated statement in his letters, but he now feels that he has overdone Tahiti and he wants something more savage. The island he settled in, in the uh, Marquesas in September, 1901, was the right island. Uh, Hiva Oa is the home of the Puama Valley uh, that we see here and it's shrine of Tiki's large stone statues, many of them larger than uh, life size, and one specific one, which uh, is really amazing. It's either flying or swimming. Uh, nobody knows. It's so unique that nobody really knows what is going on with this statue. But unfortunately, he never sees it. And he never sees it because he can't walk. And in order to get there, he'd not only have to get into a boat and go around the island, but from the little fishing village of Puamau, he would have to uh, go inland two kilometers, and he just can't do that. Uh, in September 1901, uh, he arrives there by October, uh, excuse me, in September, he arrives there, he attends mass like a good Catholic, just as long as he needs in order to get the bishop to sell him a piece of land on which he builds a new house, stops going to mass, labels the house, the Maison de Jouil, the house of sexual pleasure, and um, decorates it with nudes. He also, in October, persuades the chief to remove the 14-year-old they Oho from Catholic school. Uh, so he seems to be rebuilding this sensual life that he always wanted. Not quite. First of all, Veoho gets pregnant, as you can see here, and the confrontation between the Catholic nun in her dark, clothed, uh, closed position, um, obvious rosary and small figure uh, is in contrast to the warm colors of the natives, Marquesans and uh, of the Hio, who is, however, relatively embarrassed in front of the nun who has come to check up on her. Uh, the Hio will go back to her hometown in Puamoa, uh, where she has a daughter whom Gauguin never sees. The real change is that Gauguin is so sick uh, with syphilis and with pain and with the sores and on the morphine that his interest in sex is waning. And uh, he shows that very clearly in Adam and Eve where Eve is receptive. She's willing to yield. She's taken and anything that hides her uh, sexuality away. She's giving in both to him and to the snake, but he's not interested anymore. Gauguin literally walks out of the picture. Uh, at the time that the Ojo returns home, uh, Gauguin thinks of going to Spain to paint the bulls and the Spanish women in a new way, but actually doesn't want to leave the Marquesas. In January 1903, there's a cyclone. He gives part of his land to a native friend whose house has been ruined. In February, he unsuccessfully defends the natives against charges of drunkenness. In March, he sued for libel, fined, and sentenced to jail. In April, he loses the appeal, and on May 8th, he dies apparently from a heart attack. Now, during this period, although he 
doesn't really want to go back to, to France. This idea of going to Spain is part of his nostalgia for Europe. And it had actually uh, appeared twice during the period he was in uh, Tahiti and the Marquises. First, a short time after his attempted suicide, he obviously had a photograph of this painting that he had done in Brittany in 1894. And he um, uses it in reverse because it's a woodcut in the background here. You recognize, I'm sure, the Nizon cavalry that we have seen before. And the uh, cattle uh, are from an Egyptian um, tomb painting that he had a photograph of. In 1902, possibly when he hears of uh, the birth of Vahio's daughter, uh, he does this Christmas Eve scene with a nativity as a statue here, and another Briton, Breton snow scene in the background with a church very clear and women in the headdress of Le Poldu with the Egyptian cattle. Uh, the background is based on this painting, which was discovered on his easel when he died. This was uh, for many years thought of as a romantic story that somebody had concocted and that he actually brought it from Brittany with him. But that's not true. This was painted on the same canvas. It was a very special canvas that he was using during his trip to the Marquises. And therefore, uh, it dates from that period and it's quite logical that it would have been on his easel. Now, I uh, hope that I have given you an insight into Gauguin and let, let's now try to get some uh, conclusions of the whole problem of migration from him. First of all, there's a language problem. With Gauguin, it was Spanish, French, and basic Tahitian. He made mistakes both in French, which was his second language, and in Tahitian, uh, he used Tahitian titles to make the works more exotic. Um, the second problem is that he has an attraction to the foreign. That includes his choice of his Danish wife and the art from all over that he incorporates into his own art. But he always felt foreign and different wherever he was, despite attempts to live like the natives and identify with them. He played with national identities and costumes, uh, the Spanish and French in France. Then he wore Breton clothes in Brittany as opposed to his Parisian wear, and he wore that also in Paris. Uh, he was French at first in Tahiti, but when native, he was Tahitian in France, making his studio into something that would give an idea of Tahiti. He was French colonial and native in his second trip to Tahiti, and he was fully native in the Marquesas, defending the natives from the French. There's a split in his character, styles, subjects, artistic influences that parallels the split in his national identity. As a European, he is sensitive, refined, Christ-like, and a martyr. As an Inca, he is savage, coarse, primitive, demonic, and monstrous. He has a, a wanderlust and an inability to settle down, a constant need for new experiences and inspiration from foreign and primitive cultures, which he finds more civilized than that of Europe. And he has nostalgia, first of all, for the warmth of his childhood in Peru, but at the end of his life for Europe and for Spain, which would have been a return to his childhood language and customs. So it's practically a full circle. I hope uh, that you now have a fuller picture of this very controversial artist who's been blamed with everything, including abandoning his family and uh, taking up with young women who are uh, young girls who, who actually in Tahiti form uh, the basis of the time of life that one gets married. As you pass puberty, you're ready for marriage. 
there's a clear division at the puberty stage. And uh, this was a usual thing for uh, Tahitians who lived a relatively short period compared to the Europeans. Ziva? Yeah. A tour de force. Thank you. Um, I, I'm sure I talk for everybody to say that uh, engaging would be the understatement, uh, extraordinary clarity of what who must be surely one of the most complex of the great masters of 20th century art. Would, would, you, would, you, would you agree with that? Well, not 20th century art, but 19th century oh, art. 19, yes, yes. Died in yes. 1903. Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. But, um, but, and I don't really know where to start. And so, first of all, my apologies to, to all our guests. I omitted to say that please ask your questions via the chat line. So, as ever, I always miss something out. And tonight it was uh, how to ask the questions. So, we're going to, cha going to change our normal system. And uh, my colleague Clint in South Africa, who is our uh, technical guru, because um, we, are, we, are, we are an international organization, um, will uh, allow you to please uh, raise your hand technically and uh, ask, ask the question. Uh, and I think we'll do that live. So that will be interesting. There was one question that did come through the chat line, uh, which I don't know whether um, you can throw any light on it. But there is a German uh, refugee artist um, by the name of Hans Feibusch, who came Excuse to this. Me, yeah, say, say the name again. Hans uh, Feibusch, who yeah. you, you may or may not know of. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he was in, uh, in, in the Entartetet Kunst exhibition. He was considered to be degenerate. Um, and he, um, he addressed, uh, he converted to Christianity before uh, reclaiming his Judaism at the end of his life and was actually very distinguished uh, as a muralist and a painter of, of, of within churches, uh, religious uh, iconography. And uh, the question has been asked by Anwar Dawes, who's a scholar of, of, of Feibusch, uh, whether in fact uh, you would imagine if you know Feibusch's work, whether he was influenced by Gauguin. Uh, I don't know Feibusch's work well enough to answer that question, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, Gauguin influenced a lot of different people. So, I mean, okay. he, he was a very influential artist. Well, that, that, that leads on to my next question, whilst uh, hopefully the, the, the other questions will, will have a hand to come up. The, the, all the, 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 the major pioneering artists of this period um, had disciples. Uh, and but Gauguin, but they were they tended, I think, to be more uh, settled, shall we say, in one or two different locations throughout their adult life and their painting career. Gauguin was constantly on the move, and yeah. and and I wonder how 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 did he actually influence, uh, and who did he influence in in the you okay. used the word disciples. Okay, uh, first of all, in uh, Pontavon. He gathered a group of painters who included Charles Lavalle, who went with him to Martinique, and uh, included Paul Serrouzier. Uh, Schuffenecker was influenced by him. Bernard was influenced by him, and he was influenced by Bernard. Uh, Serrouzier introduced his art to a group which called themselves the Nobbies, uh, who were very happily in France. Uh, and uh, that included Maurice Denis, who also taught art, Serrusier wrote books. Uh, these were very well-known artists uh, at the time. They were all younger than Gauguin, and they actually lived all the way through. I mean, Gauguin misses, if he had gone to Spain, maybe he would have met Picasso, but there's a gap between the post-impressionists who all of them died before the 20th century art really got underway, but the Nobbies, are one of the connecting things. Now, when uh, he died, there was a big exhibition of his works in Paris in 1903. There was another major exhibition of his works and his sculptures in 1906 at the Salon d'Automne. 
that influenced Gauguin, uh, P Picasso, excuse me, that influenced Picasso, that influenced Matisse, that influenced a whole generation of 20th century artists. Uh, it influenced people like Paula Modersen Becker in Germany. Uh, it had a tremendous influence. Uh, articles were written about him. Pictures were displayed by him. Uh, he was starting to be, after he died, where he couldn't make any money from it, he, uh, the prices went up. Uh, he was in major museums. It, it, it spread pretty much like wildfire, um, more or less the same way that Van Gogh became very popular the minute he committed suicide. So, uh, and it was also, there's the, the legends of him. Somerset Maugham wrote The Moon and Sixpence, which is full of all the wrong messages about Gauguin, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it made him very famous. So you, you have this sort of um, legends of Gauguin and the Gauguin paintings which are, and sculptures which are being seen. Uh, Picasso was influenced by Gauguin's sculpture, not only by his paintings. So um, it goes on from there. And do you think that Gauguin was, during his lifetime, was aware that his uh, uh, extraordinary character, shall we say, uh, his diversity of behavior, uh, was actually creating almost a cult uh, following? Uh, I don't think he was aware of it, but he certainly contributed to it, especially with Noah Noah, uh, which, uh, you know, that this tale of his life in Tahiti, which definitely contributed to the whole legend. Can I talk, ask you, uh, well, first of all, Clint, are there any hands up? I don't want to be uh, dominating the questions. I, I, I could I could discuss it with Ziva till tomorrow night. Clint? We don't, any... have any, we don't have any right now, but... Okay, uh... okay. Well, let, let me take advantage of that situation and, and ask the questions which I, I often wanted to ask. Am I being completely unfair by suggesting that Gauguin's work with wood seemed to come very naturally to him? The, 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 there's, an, there's an almost an elegance to it, no matter the, the complexity of the subject matter. But yet in stone or, or, or other mediums, it's, it's very much, um, I use the word rougher, I don't mean it just in texture. Or am, am I being, am I misunderstanding? You know, his, his, uh, he actually did two marble statues, but uh, one of Meta and one of his oldest son, Emil. But um, he, did, we don't really know 100% how much he was helped in that by uh, a sculptor who lived under him. Uh, but yes, I would say he must have been playing with wood on board all those ships that he was running around the world in for, for six years. And he was definitely drawing, as we could see from that, supposedly the first drawing, uh, et cetera, which is very far from being anybody's first drawing. So uh, I would he, he didn't do stone statues. He, what I called, what you're thinking of stone is the stoneware ceramics. Stoneware yeah. is a type of clay that is very, very rough, that is used for ceramic sculpture, but it's not stone. He did do the two marble sculptures, but they're the only stone sculptures that he did. And they're very refined. And to continue, uh, if I may, one um, of the things- David, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Yvonne, had a qu Yvonne had a question. Please, I don't know if she Yvonne. wants to ask, ask her a question now. Please. Okay, thanks very much. I'm gonna try and sign myself on. Okay, and my video. Okay. Okay, okay. I can't get the video. Never mind. It is me. Um, fascinating talk. Gauguin, wonderful, complex man. Um, I've had the pleasure and the luck to go to Tahiti twice. And obviously, the first time I went, I was desperate to go to the house and see the sculpture garden. It was closed temporarily. We went back again a number of years later, and it was still closed. And I wonder whether you can tell me that the general feeling was that the people in Tahiti are not very impressed with Gauguin because they believe he was a paedophile. Now, you said about the young girls, and that made absolute sense to me and somewhat negated what I'd heard. Do you have any comment to make on that? 
Uh, you're talking about the um, uh, Gauguin Museum in Tahiti? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, when I went there, it was open because we came as a Congress and we went there. Uh, it's basically, they, uh, they had possibly one actual Gauguin painting uh -huh. and all the rest were postcards. Oh. So you didn't miss much. Uh, it, it may have improved since then, but it's not true that they thought of that in Tahiti, he was thought of in a, a bad way in the modern period. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, they have, ta they have Gauguin tours. Yes. They take you from Tahiti to yes. the Marquises, etc. It's yeah. big business. Yeah. Uh, and um, in the Marquises, they rebuilt his house and made copies of the reliefs with the, the nude woman and the, the name Maison de Jouil. Uh, so uh, they're very positive about him because they understand. When I spoke to people who were in Tahiti, who were ta you know native Tahitians, uh -huh. They said, well, of course you marry after puberty. You only yeah. last until you're 50. You got to make the most of life. <laughs> and that makes absolute sense. And may I say in that case, it made me much happier to think that, that they do actually, because I also thought, well, actually they're cutting off their noses to spite their face because he must bring in so much money from tourism. But I'm pleased that it's for the right reasons. So thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. By the way, you should know that... Uh, People in Tahiti who collect art mostly keep them in their safes because um, there's an insect infestation that you could, you know, spend millions on a painting and come back and it's not there. It happened to Gauguin himself on a very big painting that he did, that he was away for a couple of months and the insects got at the painting and completely ruined it. Oh, tragic, tragic. Well, I've got a couple of carvings from the Marquesas, but they're actually in bone, so hopefully they'll be okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. Bye. David, we've got another question from David Friedman. I'm going to ask him to. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your absolutely fascinating uh, and learned talk. A, a fairly quick question then about Gauguin, the man, and how much you felt that throughout his life he wanted to assimilate and belong how much he wanted to be the outsider, how much he resented being perceived as an outsider, and how much he drew strength from that? I think a combination of all four of those. Uh, I yes. think that, that uh, you know, as a relatively normal human being, he wanted to belong, okay? Uh, but when... Uh, he had the kind of character that when uh, you said to him, well, I'm not interested in you, and he would go and say, well, I'm not interested in you either. You know, so it's, uh, there's a contrariness in there, uh, and there's a need in him to be nominant, to uh, express himself. Uh, so if, if you don't love him, he doesn't love you. That's all there is to it. That's what eventually what messed up his relationship with his wife, who claimed that she was more of a uh, mother than a wife, and whom he never forgave for not joining him in Paris, not uh, understanding his wish uh, to be an artist, uh, closing her bedroom door so he couldn't come in, you know, little things. Thank you. Okay, there's one more question from Robert. Robert Parks. Yes. Uh, his mic's off. Mr. Parks. Yeah. How's that? Can you That's hear? It. You're, you're now on. 
as a post-impressionist painter, what did he share with Van Gogh, Sura and Cezanne? They were all searchers that went beyond the relationship between canvas and object. They were all spiritual, which was the additional element they brought to their art. Can I suggest that they were all driven by inner impulses and in this sense was different to what had happened before in Western art? Obviously, it materialized in different styles. Would you agree? I mean, when when he did the talisman, for example, that was, you know, he was going out beyond Gauguin and making, a, you know, and asking Sir Rousier to paint that, uh, the painting on. on, yeah, on right. The, but um, all of them, uh, Sir Rat in his style of painterism, it, it, where did that come from? Or Sir Rat, uh, Van Gogh? His different, his expressionist style, Cezanne, in the way he really stared stared at the object. Yeah, they, well, it was sort of, it, it was basically the symbolist period in between the impressionists that, that gave them that spiritual dimension. Would you agree in that sense? Uh, I think that um, whether Cezanne or Seurat had a spiritual dimension is a little bit upper uh, grab that hasn't really been so thoroughly investigated. Um, um, that's equally true of Toulouse Lautrec, uh, but uh, they all come out of impressionism going in different directions. They have things that are in common. Uh, they all play with three dimensions against two dimensions in their work as part of their style. They, uh, they all are turning their back on the uh, immediate impression from nature and trying to go in different ways, whether it's in defining nature in a scientific manner as Surah did, or uh, trying to get um, their own specific uh, take on nature and make it work with the canvas as Cezanne did. Um, the interesting group in there is of course, Gauguin and Van Gogh. Uh, they, um, that whole period in Orals, and actually their whole relationship, because they didn't break the relationship after Orals, they remained friends, and Gauguin had very good memories of uh, Van Gogh afterwards, and uh, Van Gogh actually would take Gauguin's side against Theo. Uh, and try to explain to Theo what Gauguin was trying to do. So um, there you had uh, two people who are really thinking in many ways in the same way, uh, in that they're not merely reacting to what they see, but to what they feel and to uh, ideas that they're trying to get across that are expressed through their colors and their shapes. Um, the, the problem between them is that they were uh, both very dominant in their theories of art and uh, Van Gogh's mistake was to say to Gauguin, well, of course, you know better, you know, you are the maître, uh, you are the person that I am bringing in here to help me with my art. And Gauguin said, oh, goody, that's just what I wanted to do. Uh, whereas uh, Van Gogh didn't mean it. And he, he would give in to Gauguin's influence to paint from memory, which he didn't want to do, uh, to paint certain things that he didn't want to do. And eventually it cracked. Um, and Gauguin was being his usual dominant self going merrily on his way with anybody who would let him. Van Gogh, on the other hand, was uh, shakier and uh, had always been super emotional and super um, changing his mind about how he was reacting to things. Uh, you know, that he, when you read his letters all the way through, you, you get this feeling of how he changes his mind and he goes suddenly in a different direction and uh, it can drive you pretty crazy if you have to live with somebody like that. But um, they did have in common uh, both uh, an interest in religion, an interest in a way of expression, expressing religion. Uh, Gauguin 
did his Geth Christ in Gethsemane after Van Gogh had tried two or three times to do a Christ in Gethsemane. So they came together on a lot of things. They just didn't get along if they lived together. I like particularly what you said about all four of those post-impressionists tried to bring three dimensions into two dimensions. And th that, that, that for me um, is unique and, and, and unites them even as a, an initial statement. Thank you very much. Okay. That's all the, the hands we've got. Okay. David, you want to turn yourself on? You're off, David, your mic's off. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I, I think the word unique um, that Robert just talked about is a very good uh, entree uh, into bringing this wonderful evening to a close. I think in many ways it has been unique. Um, the, 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 the clarity of which you can impart scholarly information in such an accessible way has always been, uh, I've always been in awe of it. I, 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 I can't, I can find no uh, idea of, of never enjoying listening to any opportunity. And I hope that we can tempt you back to talk about Chagall, who I know is another one of your great uh, specialist subjects. Um, but I, it, talking about uniqueness, if I may, uh, just talking about Ben Uri, um, you know, we, we're, we're 106 years old. So we, we, I guess between the two of us, we're about there, but, um, but the, it's a remarkable uh, institution. And we are the only institution that actually has been focusing, not just for the last 20 years, on the whole immigrant experience in the visual arts. But in reality, we, we was, we've been addressing this since the start without really knowing we had because we were founded by an immigrant artist and the whole collection was actually, although it was uh, considered for so long as being a collection of Anglo-Jewish artists, the reality is it was a collection of immigrant artists, immigrant Jewish artists who happened to be fortunate enough to find safety and freedom in our great country. So it's a, it's, it is a unique institution and the work that we do both in the research unit uh, led by our director, Sarah McDougall, um, actually records the Jewish and immigrant contribution to British visual culture and is undoubtedly already becoming a uh, almost a first stop for researchers and, and individuals. The, it's probably a, a good time to give all our uh, visitors uh, a, a, a breaking news, uh, advance notice before the press release goes out, that actually Venuri has, this last two months, expanded considerably uh, its leadership. And I'm very delighted to announce uh, here on our first night, so you get, it's a bit like Parliament, Parliament should know first before the press, so our, 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 our visitors should know first. Uh, David Brewer is our new Chief Executive, um, who will take over from me in that role, and uh, he has a, a lifelong experience both in the arts and museums and in the business world, so it's a wonderful combination that is absolutely right for our future. And we've also expanded the board uh, by eight exceptional individuals who have taken res executive responsibilities for portfolios and we are managing the current and developing Benuri.org and our digital institution but also have five people who have great skills and experience in, in developing the museum of tomorrow the digital museum of tomorrow and um, so we're managing today and developing tomorrow simultaneously so that's very exciting and you guys, everybody, you're the first to hear. So thank you for joining us. And uh, next month, uh, the next topic is on the 13th of April, uh, where Dr. Eckhart Gillen, a very distinguished German art historian and curator, will talk on Ron Kitai. Um, uh, Eckhart was the curator of, of the most recent uh, major exhibition of Kitai that started off at the Jewish Museum in Berlin, came to London. Uh, I personally had a involvement in that exhibition, I'm proud to say, and uh, I can I know Eckhart's work exceptionally well, and it will be a fascinating evening. And David Brewer will actually interview uh, and, and lead that conversation because he uh, was uh, new, new, new Kitai well, so that will make a fascinating evening. So please, everybody, be safe, 
please uh, support Bernoulli when we ask you at the end of the month for our first public fundraising, which we need to fulfill our art research and our art and health projects. But most importantly, think of those poor, innocent people, not that far from us, who are currently this moment in time being shelled because of one man's uh, paranoia that uh, he should turn the clock back. And that's where our hearts and our minds go whilst we manage our own uh, world, fortunately, in safety in this country and in Israel. So thank you so much indeed. Please follow Benuri.org. Ziva, my, my huge appreciation for your lecture this evening. Thank and you. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you back and we wish everybody a very good night. Thank you. Okay.